Hello and welcome to The Violin Chronicles, a podcast in which I, Linda Lesbe, will attempt to bring to life the story surrounding famous, infamous or just not very well known, but interesting violin makers of history. I'm a violin maker and restorer. I graduated from the French Violin Making School some years ago now, and I currently live and work in Sydney with my husband Antoine, who is also a violin maker and graduate of the French school, l'École Nationale de Lutherie in Mircourt. As well as being a luthier, I've always been intrigued with the history of instruments I work with, and in particular, the lives of those who made them. So often, when we look back at history, I know that I have a tendency to look at just one aspect, but here my aim is to join up the puzzle pieces and have a look at an altogether fascinating picture. So join me as I wade through tales not only of fame, famine and war, but also of love, artistic genius, revolutionary craftsmanship, determination, cunning and bravery that all have their part to play in the history of the violin. Hello and welcome to season two of The Violin Chronicles. I'm so excited to be here and coming up in these episodes I'll be looking at some really interesting makers in this new season that you might have not considered thinking of so far and ones that you definitely have considered thinking of. First of all, I'd like to say a really big thank you to the Patreons for supporting this podcast. And I wanted to say that I'm working on even more Patreon only content for you guys. And it's been really great to get to know a lot of you and, and have a chat about some of the projects you're doing. Um, it's been wonderful. If you too would like to become a Patreon, uh, you can go to Patreon forward slash the violin chronicles and to access extra episodes interviews, early releases, and also another little podcast called the Encyclopedia of Luthiers. But today is the day that we are going to learn the difference between two makers that I don't know about you, but I keep confusing, and they are Mr. Ruggieri and Mr. Rogeri. Whenever someone starts talking about either of these two luthiers, I start drifting off trying to remember which one is which. I mean, did you even realize they were two different people? Did you think it was the same person, but just said in a, in a different way? Didn't one live in Brescia or was it Cremona? Well, here we go. In these episodes, we're going to talk about these two violin makers, why they were different, how you can tell the difference, and what was so important about their making that we're still talking about them today. Here's someone who really knows what they're talking about, so why don't I let him explain who these two people are? I'm Jason Price. I'm the founder and director of Teresio. Uh, Teresio is a, was started 25 years ago in New York City, and now we have offices in London and also Berlin. We do auctions, we do private sales, and we also are the maintainers and curators of this thing called the Cozio Archive. So for this this one, I'm looking at Ruggeri. And, um, and also Rogeri, though. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Sure. I think we, we, I have to be careful with our pronunciation here because it, 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 you say, can we start with Ruggeri? Oh, oh, yeah. And I could interpret that as a U or an O. Yeah. So I think I, I've I've done that over the years when I'm... It's amazing how similar they are. Mm-mm. And if you're not sure, you try, you can say something in between and no one can really question you. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Ruggeri. Very good. Or, or would you, could you uh, quickly just outline the difference between Rogeri and Ruggeri? Yes. So they are different people. That's the primary difference. Um, they're both violin makers. Ruggeri, uh, Francesco Ruggeri, was the the first of of his family that we know of to make violins, and they lived in Cremona. And he had four sons who helped him. Ruggeri came from Bologna and appeared in the Amati workshop sometime in the middle of the 1650s, somewhere in there. He was there for three years, and then he uh, shows up in Brescia two years later. The names are super similar, but that's actually a pretty common name, Ruggeri, and the the variation Rogeri. It's not super surprising that they're they're similar, but it does make it a little bit difficult. Sometimes you see people uh, over the past 300 years have sort of tripped over the two names and sometimes use them interchangeably by mistake. Yes, and I also saw that on some uh, legal documents at the time, Rogeri was spelt Ruggeri, Ruggeri. Yes, it's, well, most of most of them were, you know, functionally illiterate, you know, n- unable to actually write much except maybe sign their own name. So it's it, it's no surprise that it popped up in different ways. In 
previous episodes, we have looked at various families living in Cremona, in particular the Amati family and their incredible craftsmanship, innovation and influence on all things violin. So many of the great makers were influenced by this family, and Ruggeri included. In this show, we will be looking at the life of this maker, Francesco Ruggeri, where he learnt to make instruments, how he fits into the story, and I will talk about something quite innovative Francesco did that today almost everyone will give the credit to Antonio Stradivari for. And finally, I'm going to tell you how to tell the difference and remember how to tell the difference between these two makers, Ruggeri and Rogeri. Okay, so we have two violin makers living at the same time in the same country. They are both important in their own ways. Let's start with the one who was born first, and that is Francesco Ruggeri. In the 18th century, Italy was not the country we know it today. It was a collection of warring states ruled by powerful families or even foreign powers, as was the case for the northern part of Italy in which we find our city of Cremona. Death was everywhere. For a ruler of a powerful family, if you weren't murdered by a close family member, infection and viruses were all too happy to take you. For the industrious citizens of Cremona, passing soldiers on campaign, famine, economic downturn and plague were just a few of the obstacles facing the early 17th century Cremonese. And into this tumultuous time, a woman living outside the walls of Cremona had a baby called Francesco, who would grow up and change the course of musical history with the help of his crafty hands and inventive spirit. Francesco Ruggeri was born in the city of Cremona in 1629, into a world literally of war, famine, plague and pestilence. And if this wasn't bad enough, there was a recession going on. If you can remember from the episode on Nicola Amati, it was not such a great time. Andrea Guarneri, who we will meet in a future episode, is a four-year-old, and Girolamo Amati, Nicolò Amati's father, is still alive for the time being. The previous year, the city was hit hard with French and German armies passing through the town, carrying diseases, including the plague, and if you were in a situation such as the Ruggeri's, Life was not stable or certain in any way. Ruggeri is born into a post-plague Cremona that is now going through a recession and one of the town's most important industries is struggling. This would have had a direct impact on many citizens of the city. To get an idea of what was going on, I spoke to Dr Emily Brayshaw, fashion historian. So tell me, what is happening? (laughs) What's happening is, so the textile industries, if you like, in Cremona, cotton in particular, because it's um, on the River Po there and you've got like floodplains and cotton's a very thirsty, thirsty crop. So you need like centres with a lot of water for textile production and, and cultivation as well. Like you need a lot of water for the mills and stuff like that. So that's why this Lombardy region was quite well known for textiles because there's also like the you can sail them down the river as well so this is why we see cities like Augsburg in Germany for example as well are huge textile centers because there are so many rivers that can be used the water can be used for dyeing for milling and then you've also got barges and the boats where it can all be shipped down what's happening as well is these cotton producing towns this is essentially before Ruggeri's time but what it can also do you've got high levels of output of a standardized low cost goods for mass market so that's what's sort of happening in um, Cremona as well Genoa Vellis things like that what's happening as well with cotton though is sometimes too you've got the war definitely and you've also got coming in to Europe from this time you've got the Indian cottons and the chintzes and the calicos and they are so popular it is off the hook popular because what they can do is they can do like woodblock printing and methods of patterns into the textiles which the Europeans couldn't do so essentially if they wanted patterns in their textiles they either had to weave them in 
or they had to paint them on. A lot of these chintzes from India as well, because of the process that they're making them, they're quite robust, but they're also really pretty. So they're really great for home furnishings and textiles. Basically, this is also another reason for the sort of the decline as well. And they sort of also can't um, lower their prices too because of high wages, fiscal imports as well, tolls, levies. What happens generally also during a plague is that, so for example in Cremona, before the plague you've got like 37,000 people living there. After the plague you've got 17,000. Yeah. That's gigantic. So you've got the loss of a skilled labour pool, but you've also got the remaining people can basically charge what they want for their labour. Yeah. Right. So you've got a society in huge social upheaval. And this has got big implications for not only textile production, but for fashion and dress as well, because you've got a great deal of social mobility. You might have one person who suddenly inherits all the wealth of a whole bunch of different families. You've also got land, they're inheriting land, but there's nobody to work the land. You've got all of these sorts of things coming into play. So the cotton manufacturing firms fell from a peak of 138 in 1627 in Cremona to about 60 by 1631 following the plague declining to 41 in 1648. So that's, that's huge. It is huge. And it's essentially collapsing because of these things like the influx of chintz, the cloth sales to the Ottoman market. The Ottoman markets don't want their cottons anymore, plus the plague. And the remaining guild members essentially declared themselves too poor and miserable to pay their share of the taxes imposed on the guild. <laughs> Guilds of bleachers, doublet makers were also said to be almost extinct. The Ruggeris, unlike the Amatis, lived outside the city walls, and any threat of invasion or food security during a famine was not assured. They were of the more vulnerable citizens of the city. Recently, during a famine, the city had closed its gates, guarding the grain stores within, leaving the people living outside the city to fend for themselves. And if you think things couldn't get any worse for a family with a small baby, well, they did. Because the year after Francesco Ruggeri was born, one of the worst bouts of the bubonic plague came to town, wiping out almost half of the population, including Niccolò Amati's father and other family members. After this plague, in which so many people died, there were not only many craftsmen of the city who passed away, but also the farmers who grew crops, and it, this in turn led to yet another famine. And then there were more soldiers marching through Cremona. The wealthiest citizens were able to avoid taxation and were not obliged to house soldiers garrisoned in the area, unlike the poorer citizens. The tax collectors were sucking the farming peasants dry and their productivity was diminishing. Francesco's family does not appear to be wealthy and they may have had to billet soldiers in the years he was a child. Well, despite all the odds, this little guy made it and survived. This was the world the young Ruggeri grew up in. The families who survived the plagues, war and famine were making their way in a city with many of its buildings in disrepairs and houses vacant and abandoned. There was a lack of manpower in every domain. And perhaps because of this vacuum and the unlikely chance that he survived, this young man was able to be apprenticed to a trade and find himself in the workshop of one of the best violin makers in the country, that of Niccolò Amati. Jason Price. Um, so, so we don't actually know this. Um, he obviously would have had interactions with Amati, and Amati was 20 years older than he was, uh, and well established by virtue of his his uncle and father being in the business. And all these guys, they not only were they part of the circle of violin makers, but they're also part of a circle of woodworkers. And this is something that we don't often consider, but you know there were a lot of overlapping trades that were active in small towns like this, and. They tended to ghettoize where you have all the, the carpenters in one street and you had all the, you know, stonemasons in another one. And I, I have a feeling that, you know, obviously, however Ruggeri started, he certainly knew of the Amati workshop. It, that's, um, that, that we have to accept as a given. And he would have had some exposure personally to Niccolò Amati. 
there are some really specific parts of the way his instruments are made, which make it seem to make it unlikely that he actually learned from directly from Amati or that he was a that he was a disciple who followed the Amati um, the Amati style and the Amati working methods precisely. But his instruments certainly, you know, at least from ten feet away, are pretty close to what an Amati model is. Right, and and he he knew him. As well, like be, um, because there's the story of his being a, um, a godfather to one of his. Wait. That's right, I- exactly. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. He was the two were obviously in some sort of a you know, social relationship, and it doesn't seem that they were in bad terms at all. It's perhaps a little bit of competition, but also uh, respecting each other's differences. You know, and and if it is like we're sketching it out that Amati was doing the, the fancy violins and Ruggeri was doing the less fancy violins, there's a lot of room for both of those two to coexist and to support each other. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, even like Francesco's violins, they really are. There's some really beautiful uh, instruments. Absolutely, as well, yeah. um, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, at, at his best, Francesco Ruggeri was as good as Amati. Um, I think one of the things that distinguishes them is that there were there were several gradations of work particularly in the bigger instruments in the cellos, which make his lesser work considerably less fine than Amati. But I was just going to say stylistically that there really are some, uh, you know, you look at them from 10 feet away and there's some some obvious similarities. They're both a, an Amati model. Um, but when you start looking up close, you see some things that are different. Cremona, even though it is in Italy, was under Habsburg rule and in such was influenced by Spanish customs and fashion that people in the streets would have been wearing around this time that Francesco Ruggeri was growing up. So what did the people look like in Francesco's lifetime? Emily Brayshaw. Ruggeri's life is almost, fits in almost uh, quite well with uh, Louis XIV and his reign. Yeah, so we've got fashion and we've got dress and it, Italy's also fashion sort of before that is essentially very regional and you're dressing to show your allegiances, right? Who you are, where you are, what provinces you belong to. And this occurs all throughout Europe. And so you get like huge v- regional variations around the time that Ruggieri is born and up really until sort of around, I would say, 1670. We really, 16, yeah, 1660, 1670. What we're seeing early on, like there are lots of different regional variations in Italy particular, like Venice is a republic, yeah. so it's doing its own thing. Whereas the northern Italian states like Milan and Genoa and Cremona. They're still under the Habsburg rule. And, and Spanish rule, yes. Yeah. So they are wearing really between 1630 and 1670, they are wearing very Spanish inspired styles. And so it's interesting you say that because there's kind of this um, tensions between Spanish dress and French dress, which are quite different, and English dress is doing its own thing again. And so you've got this really crazy kind of look that the Spanish had that were worn in places like Genoa and Milan, and I think they were worn in Cremona as well. And it was a women's undergarment called the Garda Infante. Oh, wow. It's like a free-hanging structure, like in sort of early, so early 17th century, we have um, the English and French wearing a garment that we call the Farthingale. And if you think of Queen Elizabeth I, how she sort of wears the corseted shape and then her skirt comes out flat, like a drum and hangs down that's the farthingale and the spanish had their own version of it but it sort of looked more like a cone with a very narrow waist and a wide shape the ice cream cone exactly the cornetto exactly yeah and this kind of started to evolve into a new type of hoop skirt that expanded and it sort of combined this French farthingale that extended the hips 
it still had the cone shape. So it took up an incredible amount of space and it was essentially a free hanging structure. So it wasn't sewn into a skirt. It was tied around the waist to extend from the hip and then hoops were attached to each other by straps and they hung from the waist to the ground. It could be made out of baleen or iron or wicker, cane or wood and you'd have multiple layers of overskirts. Again, it's taking up space and they're just kind of giving, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's kind of one of those funny garments like women's dress and fashion gets policed by men throughout centuries, right? And so this idea, Garda Infante, it gets outlawed. These garments get outlawed in Spain, in Madrid, in 1639, saying that only prostitutes are allowed to wear them. Right. Right. And so we sort of see like the skirts hung out the windows and the cage frames hung out the windows. And even the tailors who made them were threatened with like exile for the first offence and imprisonment for the second. And part of what this policing is all about is this sort of common myth that women were wearing them to um, hide illicit pregnancies. Ah. Yeah, it's the Garda Infante. Yeah, Garda Infante. And and of course, if you actually look at them and you understand bodies and pregnancies, you know that you're not going to be hiding a pregnancy belly under one of these things. But then there's all sorts of things like these hoop skirts. These Garda Infante are so large that it's like, well, men are hiding under there. You can hide a man (laughs) under your skirt. And what's going on there? And there are all sorts of policing in Spain too about the modest women. Women should dress modestly. And if you're dressing up in the latest fashions with, uh, you know, makeup, hairstyles, luxury textiles, you're not dressing modestly. But sometimes women are caught in a bind too because a woman should be looking good for her husband. So she should wear what her husband tells her. But then what does she do if her husband says... Where are the latest fashions? And of course, you've also got women dressing to please themselves as well. You know, like we've always done that. And that's really what it's all about. Sometimes you just have to hide a man under your skirt. You do. You you do. So, you know, these Garda Infantes, though, they were worn as far afield as Mexico City. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah, and Genoa. So they were huge, right? They were huge. The thing with, like, this band, though, is Philip IV of Spain All his own wives and daughters wore it and the royal women wore them. They sort of served the crown's agenda and we think that this is also because it was associated with pregnancy and, of course, royal women, their key function is to bear heirs. So if a princess or a queen is wearing this garment, it kind of promises fertility and political stability that comes with uncontested succession, right? We see Maria Theresa wearing one of these Garda Infantes to meet her future husband, Louis XIV of France. So she wears the whole thing and she arrives in the French court and it looks so different from what the French women are wearing that she really eventually, for her marriage at the Mass, adopts French style, which is a hoopless dress and cape. At the time, and so it's her bowing to France essentially sartorially by abandoning this. But yeah, we do see them. They're very Genoa and Milan, possibly also Cremona. They're they're very popular as well because Cremona's still aligned with Spain in a lot of these ways. I'm trying to think of the door the doorways that <coughs> would have to accommodate you. Um, yes. You have to fit, how do you fit through the door? Um, so a lot of the time, women would have to stoop. You would need to be escorted by either servants. A few years after the plague of 1630, Niccolò Amati, finding himself with a lot less family members and without a family of his own, started to take on apprentices. One of the longest lasting and faithful of these apprentices to Niccolò Amati is a man called Andrea Guarneri, who lived in the Amati household. 
He was only a few years older than Francesco, and as Ruggeri grew up, he would have been apprenticed himself at the age of about 14 or 15. There is no record of him living in the Amati household, but then again, he already lived in Cremona and did not need to be housed with the master. Jason Price and Ruggeri was also, he lived on the outside the walls of yep, Cremona. Exactly. So was, is that significant if you didn't live in I, I think so. the wall? Uh, seeing, I mean, like armies are coming through. Would you, are you, kind, are you less protected maybe? Um, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's for protection or prestige. I think that if you were, you know, a visiting important person, you wouldn't want to, you know, you wouldn't want to meet someone out behind a barn just outside of the city walls, mm. you'd want to meet someone on the flashiest street in town with, you know, uh, nice, um, nice, uh, I was going to say cars on the street. That's not exactly what you'd find, but you know, you'd find, um, horse, donkeys. there you go. The best horses in carts. town. Nice carts. Nice carts. That's it. Yeah. You, 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 if you were visiting, um, you know, posh person looking to acquire a violin, you would want to make that purchase from someone in the center of town. You wouldn't want to traipse, uh, out through the walls and meet with someone in a, you know, substandard building, and um, you wouldn't want to do that. Growing up, things were still volatile from a geopolitical point of view, and when Francesco Ruggeri was 19 in the year 1648, the city of Cremona found itself in the middle of a siege with the French attacking, and eventually, it's always the French, isn't it? And eventually taking over the city briefly. Life was never dull for this young violin maker. Walking through the gates of Cremona in the morning on the way to work, you had to be prepared for anything, even the occasional French army. Perhaps Ruggeri was locked in the city during the siege that lasted for months. The army damaged a significant part of the town and there were food shortages and disease. It was around this time that Niccolò Amati and his wife would lose one of their children shortly after this event. We don't know if Francesco was with his employer and Andrea Guarneri during this time. He could have been, or if he was outside the city walls with his own family dealing with the invading army. In any case, things were tense. After the city surrendered to the French, only a few months later, the war that was raging came to an end and the French troops left leaving the city in a state, but back in control of the Spanish Habsburg powers. One could almost imagine that this war was for nothing. As time went on, Francesco continued to hone his skills as an instrument maker. He was most likely spending his days in the Amati workshop with Andrea Guarneri as a bench buddy. Also working with them was Niccolò's other living apprentice, Giacomo Gennaro, and the master Niccolò Amati himself. There was also a host of other people coming and going from the workshop over the years. Niccolò was taking on apprentices from all over, not just locals, and business was picking up. The wars were easing off, and in France, King Louis XIV was proving to be a music and art-loving king who had a soft spot for the violin. The Amati workshop was in full swing, And it was an interesting time to be an artisan in this city where people were able to reinvent themselves after so many tragedies. Niccolò Amati, as you would know if you had listened to the episodes on the Amatis, married later in life and established a large family. He appears to have had a close relationship with his apprentices and were involved in their lives. After learning his trade with Niccolò Amati for a few years, Francesco set up his own workshop just outside the walls of Cremona where he lived, in the parishes of San Bernardo at number 7 Contrada Cotella. And then, when he turned 23 in 1652, he married Ippolita Ravassi in his local church, the Church of San Bernardo. In that very same year, Niccolò Amati's other assistant, Andrea Guarneri, also married, and I could easily imagine Niccolò attending both the weddings of his assistants and wishing them on their merry way. Jason Price. Uh, At the time, there really was only the Amati 
shop in Cremona that, you know, 1630 was obviously a difficult time when we lost a couple makers um, in some other cities. And the Niccolo Amati workshop was really the only gig in town. Um, it was actually the only gig in Northern Italy that was really pumping out violins at any quantity, at least that we, that we, that we know of. And however Ruggeri got started, and there are a couple theories for that, and there are a couple, couple theories on how he, how he learned, but he became the second shop in town. Um, and it was a, it was a very productive um, workshop that he had his four sons working for him and they turned out a lot of violins. What makes it significant? I think you could make the generalization that it's the quantity was large, but the quality on average was probably a little less than what was happening um, in the center of town in the Amati workshop. The, the Ruggeri's were a little bit outside of the city walls and they were by all indicators, making for a clientele which was less distinguished than the Amatis. So perhaps this is what what makes them important, that they were um, maybe a little more affordable, maybe a little bit more uh, designed for a different type of clientele. They were very productive. He made some good innovations. You know, of course, then there's then there's also the uh, contribution he made of the people he taught. And the, the most significant one is his son, Vincenzo Ruggeri, who went on to become a great maker on his own and teacher of others. And then there's also the um, purported or assumed or, or uh, you know, theoretical connection that he had with Mr. Stradivari, which is also something uh, interesting. That was certainly a, a, significant, a significant contribution, if that's what it was. This brings us to an end of this first episode on Francesco Ruggeri. He's grown up in an unsettling time in Cremona's history, but now he's a married man who has learnt the skilled trade of an instrument maker in the city that matters in these things. Did Stradivari learn from Francesco Ruggeri? Well, join me next episode as we explore this theory and also look at new technologies of the time and what impact this has on stringed instrument makers coming out of Lombardy. I would like to thank my lovely guests, Dr. Emily Brayshaw and Jason Price, for joining me today. And if you have enjoyed this episode, please rate and review it. That really is a help for the show. And if you would like to support the podcast, head over to Patreon on Patreon forward slash The Violin Chronicles for extra content. And the latest episode is the Dictionary of Luthiers on Girolamo II, where with my husband, we talk about the crazy story of an Amati cello um, that had belonged to Clive of India. For now, I'll say goodbye and I hope you will join me for the next episode of The Violin Chronicles. Thank you.